All right, greetings everyone. My name is Sarah Barnes, and on behalf of Campbell & Company, I'd like to welcome you to Crowdfunding 101, a dynamic tool for fundraising. Before we begin today's interesting presentation, I'd like to quickly review some logistics for those of you who may be new to Campbell & Company webinars. So first, um, to ensure that you have the best webinar experience possible, please follow these tips. Close any programs other than GoToWebinars, of course. Call in using a telephone instead of your using your computer speakers, and move away your cell phone from your computer. And then if you experience any visual issues, please send a chat to Campbell & Company or contact GoTo at 1-800-263-6317. Today's webinar will last 60 minutes, and you will earn one continuing education credit for your participation, and that's good for certification with CFRE International. And about an hour after the webinar, you will receive an email from GoToWebinars that includes a web address, to download your certificate, the PDF of the presentation, as well as information on how to register for our next webinar. We definitely welcome questions during the webinar. We love to have it be as interactive as possible. So throughout the presentation, if you have a question, please feel free to chime in and send a chat to us at Campbell and & Company, and I will go ahead and ask them throughout. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brian Kish. Brian? Great. Hello, everybody, and um, thank you so much all uh, for logging on today. And there you can see mine and uh, Michael's beautiful face. He makes me look much better there. Thank you, Michael. And um, as you can see, uh, I am uh, a consultant with Campbell & Company. I've been doing annual giving consulting part-time with them for about 13, 14 years now. Uh, they're a company based out of Chicago, and hopefully a lot of you know all the great work they already do. Um, so I've seen a variety of programs, uh, both here in the U.S., Canada, and actually around the world, um, not only in higher education, but in the medical and nonprofit and independent school, and have seen quite a bit and helped uh, a fair amount of schools. And uh, hopefully today I can share um, a little bit of my knowledge and a little bit of my experience out there working with a variety of institutions to talk about the current environment um, that we're facing right now in fundraising and then talk a little bit about a potential solution. And um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. You know, you can also see there that I'm uh, full-time the Senior Vice President for Central Development here at the University of Arizona Foundation. So when I speak to you about some of the challenges and, and problems we're facing out there and, and again, the potential solutions, hey, I, um, I'm facing the same things that a lot of you are facing as well. Um, both here in higher education, and we do our medical and, and a variety of other issues. So um, hopefully I can add a, um, an angle both from a practitioner and from uh, a consultant as well. So I'm going to lead us through some of our early slides here today um, and also ask an expert to join me and be a part of this. About a year and a half ago or a year ago, um, as I was thinking more and more about the challenges we're facing, in particular in annual giving and dealing with our mass constituents and, and thinking about how these changes are impacting our program and how I think they will continue to change, maybe more importantly in the future, I start thinking about the problems that we have and what might be some of the solutions that are out there. Um, and serendipitously, uh, I saw a presentation and had started to hear a little bit about crowdfunding, but saw a presentation um, by someone that just really wowed me, Michael Greenberg, um, a gentleman that was at UCLA um, helping launch companies, and he'll tell you more about his job, but started a new company. And Michael's going to share with you a little bit about his knowledge in crowdfunding. He really is one of the leading experts in this, so much so that uh, they were able to develop their own software, which he'll tell you about as well. Um, but I think Michael is going to add so much to this conversation. He has seen hundreds and hundreds of sites, and with such a young topic, it's hard to find experts and someone with deep, deep knowledge. And I think Michael is one of those people. Now, while he is at a company that um, uh, explicitly um, has created a software package, Michael will take approach today to share with you a variety of different ways to think about um, crowdfunding. By no means today is, is a sale pitch at all. That's not what we're here about today. It's about sharing knowledge and expertise. And uh, I couldn't think of a better person than Michael in doing so. So he's going to share some great things with you. Um, do keep in mind anything that we do share with you today. Um, both that Michael has shared with you from his own company and from other companies um, and, and organizations out there. Everything is proprietary, so um, you know, keep in mind the software that you might be seeing, and Michael's going to give you a peek under the sheets at uh, some of the back end of his software. Please just keep in mind we're showing this to you as educational purposes, not to go out and, and um, 
build some of your own software. So with that, I'm going to turn it um, over to Michael to do a little bit better job of explaining um, his background and his experience. So Michael. Well, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. I actually uh, am really excited to be discussing this topic. I think it's incredibly timely. And um, the Genesis story, in brief, of how I came to uh, even tackle it was really because, like Brian, we were facing certain issues at UCLA. And UCLA, also like Arizona, is really a prismatic institution. You know, we have a world-class health center, uh, amazing research, an incredibly engaged base. And it's also just a global brand. And I find that when you have all of these things, it's very easy for new kinds of topics to kind of catch people off guard. And, and we're going to talk a little bit today both about how crowdfunding rose to prominence and where it's going, but also discuss what that really means for the nonprofit sector. Because there are many different types of crowdfunding, and I really want to zero in today in the latter half of today's discussion on, on what's relevant. Um, help help cut through the white noise. Uh, you know, we only have an hour together today, so I want to make sure that we hit some high points. But definitely, uh, presentations like this always stimulate conversation and bring up more questions than you started with. So I want to make sure afterwards too that you have a way to get in touch with Brian or I if you have more questions, because I have a feeling this is going to sort of be the start of an exploration with uh, how online is really being radically changed through crowdfunding. Great. And so, Michael, just mention, um, if you wouldn't mind, a little bit about um, the company that you all started and how you moved from your role at UCLA to saying, wait a minute, there's a problem out there. I think I can help create a solution. And talk sure. a little bit about your solution. Um, I think it might be useful. And full disclosure, we actually are clients of, um, of Scale Funder here at University of Arizona because we believe in what they created so much that we actually put our money where our mouth is. Again, this is not a sales pitch, but just... Um, um, mentioned that uh, we've been so impressed. I thought it might be worth you sharing a little bit of that as well. Sure. Uh, so actually a little bit later I'll, I'll show the project that actually uh, was the reason why this technology was created and then brought into market. Um, but in a nutshell, about 18 months ago, crowdfunding was really starting to come into its own. You were starting to see you know, major publications like the New York Times publishing articles on major external crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, and, you know, in, invariably what that did at the same time was give people inside of nonprofits a way for them to kind of go on their own, to fundraise mm -hmm. for their own topics or potentially to figure out ways to leverage this technology. And we found at UCLA that we had professors, faculty members, uh, uh, researchers, student groups, they were all looking at these sort of external technologies as a way to quickly get the word out about their particular causes. The problem, mm -hmm. was, the problem was the UCLA brand was being carried with it. And there was mm -hmm. no way for central development or frankly marketing communications to wrap their arms around it. And they couldn't mm -hmm. offer a separate solution. So, so really this all started because you know, with budgetary cuts and with annual funds under incredible pressure, you know, resources were scarce. And so people, in a sense, took it into their own hands to start fundraising for their particular needs, and that sort of led to this mass migration. Um, it was such a huge thing, it reminded me actually of what happened in 2004 to 2006 with Facebook and alumni associations, where mm. you know, up until that time, alumni associations really owned the relationship between the institution and the alumni base. And then once you had these external technology platforms like LinkedIn or Facebook, alums could get in touch with each other. They didn't need the reunion you know, dinners to see how people were doing. And so in a sense, these institutions were disintermediated from the conversation. That exactly was what was happening with crowdfunding, the, the first phase crowdfunding. So we'll kind of talk about crowdfunding 1.0 right. and 2.0. Uh, so that is exactly why we started looking at how to create a solution that would work. And then from there, we realized it was a solution that a lot of people could use. So the company was spun out, and now we have clients uh, nationally. So I'd be more than happy to talk about that. But like you said, Brian, I definitely want to give that high-level overview. Wonderful. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. And, and I should also mention congratulations to you, Michael. I heard uh, your company just got purchased by Ruffalo Cody, which I think will add even more. Um, power and oomph to the platform you guys are putting together. So congratulations on that as well. Thank you um, very much. 
But, but really to reemphasize what you just talked about, Michael, of why this became to such pro, um, prominence is, is the current environment that we're dealing with. And I think a lot of you out there are feeling this and already know this. We have more competition than ever before. The growth in nonprofits has grown 53% um, from 1998, and this was to about 2009. So we have more competition than ever before. So there is, as Michael said, more noise out there, and how do we get our message out there? And furthermore, whether we're, at, we're in higher ed or whether we're at a different nonprofit, more and more of this generation that's graduating, more of Generation Gener X, uh, Generation X and Generation Y, we're carrying more student debt than ever before. So the, whether it's perceived or real, the resources available to us are seeming less and less. You can see the chart we just put up on the screen there. You can see how college tuition has just drastically increased at a rate much higher than even the prices of homes or our consumer price index. So we're feeling a tighter budget. And then those that are soliciting us and those that are going out after us to ask for our gifts, there's more and more of that. And so we're seeing this drastic change in our demographics as well. Those that we're going out and soliciting for our gifts, the way we're soliciting them and the way we're reaching out to them was really based upon a model that was created in the 40s and 50s where most of our donors, especially here in higher education, we're older white males. Hey, and no knock on that. Thank goodness, because they've helped build these incredible nonprofits and organizations we're at. But if I look at who's being um, our constituents now, 60% of college graduates will be women by 2015. 74% increase in Latino student enrollment. There's 31% more international students attending our colleges than were just a couple years ago. And then we talk about Gen X, Gen Y. They now make up 50% of our base and almost more than 50% of the adult population now. And so if you think about our tools, they were created for a different generation, for a different demographic. But if we keep doing the same things over and over again, we're going to get different results. Or excuse me, if we keep doing the same things over and over again, we're going to get the same results. We can't have the same expectations. But in fact, actually what's happening is we're getting different results and the results we're getting is less and less. We just put up the Voluntary Support of Education, Council on Aid of Education report, showing alumni participation rates over the last five years. And in fact, I do some work with Target Analytics, and they've been showing what's been happening in the um, other nonprofit sector. The same thing has been happening, less donors over and over and over again to our institutions. And again, I pose the question, why? Well, part of it is, is their needs, their desires, what they want is different, but have we changed to meet their needs? And this is what I said in the introduction that I began to struggle with. We're seeing our results go down, and we're trying the same method, and we're getting less and less results. Because our constituents want, want, our constituents want something different. They want a different experience. They want choice. Think about all the things they have in life with choice. They want opportunities to engage and influence their friends. You know, I think about the power of Yelp and where we go now to get information. We go to get it from each other, thanks to the um, Web 2.0, you know, generation. And they want to know the impact. They want to see that their gift is making a difference. And when you think about our annual funds in general, they're not that at all, right? They're, give me the money, trust me, and we know what to do with it. But again, does it meet those needs? And this is a whole other presentation I can spend a whole day on, and I'm going quickly because I want you to really see the technology and how it works. But just stop and think about that for a moment. Think about who most of your constituents are and what they want, and then think about what you're actually giving them. And, and Brian, just to, just to jump in, I think that it's so important to level set on who these sort of donors of today and tomorrow are because that's exactly what's driving the trends and the whole reason that crowdfunding even exists. You know, this sure. came out of um, exactly what you're describing, this, this kind of new donor which is living in an on-demand generation where they can have full transparency, choice over how they engage with cause, and frankly do rely more and more on their uh, friend set when making choices. So, you know, I think we see this in so many different facets of technology today, like I said, from the rise of social uh, platforms like Facebook to Amazon giving you on-demand purchasing power. 
So I mean, you're, you're completely right, and it's in, it was inevitable that this would start to infect uh, the philanthropic trends. So yeah, I, mean, I think it's a good level set. Absolutely, and it's funny. Sometimes you know, here in nonprofits, we're behind the for-profit world, and you look at all the choices and options they're putting out there, and they treat their donors um, one to one, right? The way we're set up right now is one to many. So we think about, you know, I'm going to put out one message to many, many people and hope you all grab onto it. This creates a little bit more of a one-to-one -one model, right, where I can interact, I can have some choices, I can have some controls, I can be involved. It also then helps meet some of those needs that are beginning to evolve out of our own organizations, as you pointed out, Michael. And, and I, the example at UCLA is a funny one, and I'm glad you're going to be able to show it. But we have faculty, we have students, we have everyone with wanting more need. I'm at a public school, and we're getting less and less dollars. Someone's saying, well, where can we turn? Where can we go? And our administration's saying, well, go out and find it. So they're being entrepreneurial, which is wonderful. That's the spirit we have. But as you said, we lose some brand control, and <clears throat> we have a whole series of problems. The other thing we didn't point out, which we'll get into later, there's a whole back-end problem with some of these things as well. What happens when the money comes in? Was it philanthropic? How does it get processed? What information did we get? There's a whole series of questions there. The other thing that I really like that this um, is going to allow us to do that I think meets the needs of giving tomorrow is it allows our alumni and our communities to connect with each other, to support the things that they care about, to be engaged. This is where I begin to think about affinity giving. I have a saying in annual giving. Annual giving isn't about affordability. It's about affinity. It's not, can they afford to give to you, but why should they? What are they going to care about, and are they going to feel it's going to make a difference? And it allows them to be engaged and passionate with those projects then that they have close affinity with. And then finally, the stewardship on the back end. Again, I go back to what annual giving is about, and we say it goes to things like X, Y, Z. Things like it ain't going to cut it anymore. We need to say it went to this, here's the success, here's the measurables, and hear what it did, okay? Because frankly, giving the things like, and what the old annual fund was based upon was trust. The trust has been broken, unfortunately, and the media has highlighted some of that trust that's been broken. Every time we see a corporation that we trust in that betrays that trust, we were just talking about some examples of large companies, you even see movies um, about that today. When we see nonprofits break that trust, um, everyone now, doesn't have, let me just give you the money, and you decide to deal with it. And, so, and you know, it's, it's interesting you say that, Brian, because, you know, you mentioned Arizona and UCLA. You know, within those systems, you had so many different, in a sense, uh, charities represented. You know, we, we had a, a museums and a, a hospital system, like I said, within the UCLA uh, ecosystem. And they all have their separate groups. They all have yeah. their separate community bases. Um, and the one-size-fits-all messaging, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, people really, really develop, uh, from an affinity standpoint, a direct connection. And, you know, while you do want them to have a generalized uh, uh, love and support of your particular cause, uh, people, people have a unique connection to whatever it may be. You know, I, I, can, I speak to Meals on Wheels as a great example. You know, it's a very local feeling. It's a national organization, but with a local dynamic. And mm -hmm. with the rise of online, instead of having sort of a one-size-fits-all direct mail piece where those are important, you now can have members of your community championing causes. You know, it's, 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 called, it's sort of like the uh, famous on, uh, bake sale, but now it's been brought online. Now people <laughs> come in and champion their causes, and they can do it in an on-demand manner. And I think that's just really hard to compete with. It's, it's almost like this is such a compelling new way to promote causes you care about, but also to engage people that the other methodologies, while still important, you know, they need this now as a compliment. Because, and, and I, I love saying this, anyone you know, uh, uh, who's listening right now, especially if, if you have kids or you're part of that Gen Y or millennial generation, direct mail, what is that? I mean, I, I don't know the last time anyone also, in terms of phone calls, phone calls are important, but people are now using the phone really not primarily as a phone. They're obviously using it as a mobile computing system. That's and right. so, you know, there are new ways fundamentally that people even want to be touched or reached. 
And these kinds of technologies that we'll show you in a second are really answering that that vacuum that was there. So I I agree, and I, I think um, this slide fits. That this is one potential answer. And again, you know, we're not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater. Is that the saying? <laughs> Which is a weird saying. I have a baby. I, I'd hope to never <laughs> do that. But um, you know, we're not saying give up on mail and phone and all that. This is another tool, but I think it's a tool, as you can see here, that answers a lot of those questions. I'm not going to read them to you, but I encourage you to actually look at that because that's really the crux of what we're putting together. This is another tool that we can put in our toolbox, but it begins to answer some of those questions that we're setting forth. And what I like about it as well is it's not a new way of giving. It's a new way of packaging the giving. It's right. a new way of messaging the giving and meeting the needs of a donors. You know, a lot of folks said, let's get in the text to give. That was a whole different thing, and that's a whole different system, and hence why, you know, I'll, it's a long story, but I'll make some arguments, hasn't really flourished. Why this will is it takes a lot of the core concepts that have already been proven to be successful for us, and packaging and marketing them, giving them options and variables that didn't exist before. And granted, there are some challenges to it, and we can talk a little bit more about those, and again, maybe offline how you handle some of those things. Um, as you know, we're going really quick because we want to show you some of the technologies and examples, but again, encourage you to follow up with us if you have some different questions. So my, what I really want to do is sort of set the stage um, for Michael and let him sort of take over from here and talk a little bit more about um, how this type of technology works, because since this is a one-on-one -on -one session, Folks probably just want to say, what, what the heck is this even to begin with? <laughs> right. I'm going I'm to let you kind of Brian, Yeah. Well, Brian and Michael, we have a question from the audience that I thought um, would be timely. Um, and the question is, um, are you saying that crowdfunding is not a good vehicle for unrestricted fundraising? That's a, that's a great question. So, yeah. um, you know, actually, I'm going to show you a unrestricted campaign uh, that ran at University of California, San Francisco in a second. What we're finding is that crowdfunding is a fantastic mechanism when you package it correctly. So I'm going to actually, this might be a good time for me to transition over. So I'm going to pause the screen really quickly and go over to this particular project. Right, great. Right. And as, as you're doing that, I'll jump in as well, Michael. I, you know, again, I think as Michael's going to point out, how you package, how you market, how you talk about things is going to make a difference. Um, I would not say this is going to be your strength to also boost up unrestricted giving. I, I would not say, you know, this is the answer to that problem. And I know that's the needs. Again, think about what unrestricted giving is. That's what we want at our organizations. But is that what our donor wants? We always say be donor focused and major gifts we are. But are we in annual giving? And typically we're not because it's not about what the donor wants. It's about what we want. So I think you know, there's ways you might be able to do it, but I'm not going to come boldly and say, oh, this is a great answer for that, because I'm not sure it really is. Um, so, Michael, I'll, I'll let you come sure. back in. On yeah, absolutely. And, and this was an actual annual fund drive, um, and we kind of think of it like a hub-and-spoke model. So whenever you're doing uh, annual fund drives, for any organization, you know, they're always over a certain period of time. It creates that sense of urgency. And this, in a sense, gives you a hub-and-spoke model. So with the right kind of technology, you can actually uh, send out your direct mail pieces, send out your classic phone-a-thon, and then at the same time have a site that you've put up where other people can both keep track of the progress of said campaign, but also receive updates from people who are beneficiaries of it. So if it's an annual fund drive that might be for Nature Conservancy or it might be for scholarships, you can actually now have a sort of central hub where on all of your other messaging people can go for information and even give directly through the platform. And that's powerful. And you can also have social media sharing through it. So as you see here, the UCSF recently concluded this annual fund drive. Um, this was, I believe, a 30-day drive. And they uh, raised 248% of their goal. And it's really amazing because of this goal, it came from offline channels and online channels combined. And another neat thing is it gave really cool transparency to the donor. They got to see exactly what you know, this was supporting. They were able to receive updates on the project. And that's really powerful. You know, they're, they're able to understand you know, what's happening by giving versus the classic, here's the direct mail piece that lands on your you know, doorstep. So again, you need that in concert, but 
having that sort of centralized page where people can go and quickly give, um, and again, you see these are grayed out because the drive is over, but you could go through and quickly give at the level you choose, it was powerful. It was a very powerful way for them to, uh, to ma monitor their campaign and showcase all the information around it. Another thing I was going to say about you know, the way that unrestricted giving is being affected, it goes back to affinity. So if you can get people in the door by giving to the cause they care about and then step them up into a right. gift to, that is to the uh, institution itself, that is probably the new methodology. You can yep. no longer tell someone who either is saddled with debt or is, you know, like I said, in this new on-demand generation, hey, we'd really love you to give into a black box. That, that doesn't happen anymore. But if you say, wow, we have this cool cause that will give you a way to engage with us, and then from there you're part of our system, our family, and we can then step you up into a gift that's more generalized support, that's probably the trend where we're going. I, so I, I think it might be. It, it be it, it's a great way to begin to build the trust. And, and don't get me wrong, listen, I know we still have thousands and thousands and millions of people giving to our organization, so some do trust us and have that. But we're losing it, and we have a lot that we never got it with. And so I think you're right, Mike, this might be a great way to begin that relationship and that trust. Absolutely, and it's a really cool way to keep in touch with them at low cost as well, because every time you send out updates, you know people are receiving them now. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those things where in this particular campaign, now that it's over, they can fire off more updates to people and even embed videos, thank you videos, videos mm -hmm. from the field, six months later letting people know the impact of their gift. And when they want to run different campaigns on different verticals, they can quickly spin those up and run them and have people champion them. You know, as you see, they have here a project donor. So there's a person, they put a human face on this. They say, mm -hmm. you know, this is who I am, this faculty member, this is why it matters, and your gift is supporting this core cancer research. So I think this is the new way things are going. I mean, it, it's hard to comprehend how in the next 10 years, five years, or even three years, we're going to go back to you know, a world where the envelope that comes in your, um, in your mailbox is going to be more dynamic. Again, it doesn't mean you throw it out, but we're going to have to start complementing these other methodologies with online, true online fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, let me give a really quick preamble on what even started this whole thing. So crowdfunding is definitely not a fad. If you look at three years ago, in 20, um, 2011 actually, the end of 2011, $1.5 billion was raised in, in crowdfunding platforms. By 2012, that was at three. Last year, they passed seven billion. So it's on an exponential growth rate. And the reason for it is really very, very simple. And here's an example from a site called Kickstarter that I mentioned. And this was the Pebble Watch. Uh, and this kind of was the watershed moment for the industry. What happened here was a group of technologists said, wouldn't it be cool if this watch existed? We think it's neat. It'll sync with your phone. This would be great. We don't see it on the market. And in the old way you would do this is you'd build a couple prototypes. You'd go to the bank to get a loan. You'd try to go to some store to you know, get a purchase order. It's a very difficult process. But now what they can do is they can build one prototype, make a video on it, put it out there, share it with their friends, and see if it catches fire. And as you can see here, it caught fire. $10 million, $10 million 30 days. Now, this showed people this was a new way of engaging. This was a way where people could go in and see things that they care about or see things they wanted to become reality. And they could back it with their dollars. And that is what started this sort of revolution. And very soon thereafter, it, it went into the philanthropic sector because it's the exact same idea of what do you want to see uh, the, you know, the world become? What kind of reality or change do you want to take place? Well, if you want it, here's the goal we're trying to reach. Here's how you can make it a reality. And so to give you an example, uh, this is actually a project from Indiegogo. And this was why uh, the platform was originally built the technology out of UCLA. So we had UCLA students, they were all fantastic, they were backed by a faculty member, and they wanted to go raise money for um, a program promoting, promoting sexual education in uh, Malawi. Now the problem was, um, this was happening all over uh, campus, and this happens, by the way, we see in a lot of nonprofits where their constituents definitely want to help, but they don't have a way, in a sense, to work with uh, your marketing or your communication team 
to at least make sure they're on brand or on some sort of message. So they put this cool project out, they put up a video, and then this is what happened at the end. I'm going to really quickly let you see uh, what they threw up at the end of it. So that happened. And <laughs> UCLA, needless to say, was a little bit mortified when a condom was slapped over the L in their logo. Um, partially because I think they were in the middle of a huge uh, football season with U uh, USC and the idea of this getting on bumper stickers from the other side was terrifying. But the idea here is brand control. So this is when we realized while the method is great for what's going on, we needed a way to give all of these people who wanted to help champion our causes a platform. And that platform had to be able to both be on brand. As you see, there's no UCLA brand here. This is all about Indiegogo. This was all about Kickstarter. You know, these were external platforms that make their money based on getting all of the donor data and holding it, and obviously based on taking a percentage of everything that was raised through the platform. It makes sense. But that's a problem when you're a nonprofit of a certain size because you have multiple causes, but this isn't about one touch. You know, these projects are just one quick fundraising cause and then you go away forever. With what you were just talking about, Brian, what do you do when you raise money for a cause but then want to put a touch on that person one year later, 10 years later, 30 years later? That's where brand is so important and you want to make sure they have a place where they can go that they know is connected to you. And You're so right. That, about, that's the about the relationship, not a transaction. You're right. That's right. So it's not a one-touch engine. It's a first-touch engine. And Perfect. that's exactly why we started thinking about what really do you need to make crowdfunding work for you, not just now, but what does it take over the long term? You know? And so the first thing that you have to think about is what's the donor experience? It's the same way you think about you know, the script in your phone-a-thon campaign or the uh, way that you package your direct mail piece or even your basic website. But unlike the basic websites of yesteryear, I like to call them zombie sites because the content never really refreshes that much and there's mm. nothing really there for people to share, share socially. Crowdfunding is all about bringing people in that are members of your community and helping them refresh content. They're putting up videos, they're championing specific causes and really stimulating conversation. So this is, I'm going to say something that I think blows a lot of people's minds, but at these major institutions, Oftentimes, the amount they raise through an online channel is less than 4%. Mm -hmm. Now, in a yep. world where everyone is moving online, everyone, transactions, the way we interact with people, why in the world has the amount we raise online lagged so far behind? And it's really because we didn't have the right technologies until now. And that's where I also think you're going to start to see a real ramp up. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that just, that to me is kind of a very important thing just to hold in the back of our head, which is how much longer can we ignore what is becoming the most important channel for all of our donors and everything else they do. Hmm. I think that's critical. Um, so with that being said, let me go into, um, and Sarah, please cut in if there are any questions coming in right now, yeah. uh, but I'm going to go into you know, in what fact, the flow I, 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 oh, Sorry, Michael, real quick, I, had a, I do have a question. Um, how do you get this information out to the general public beyond your own constituency? Mm -hmm. Great question. So how does it go viral? Okay. Correct. So there's a, there's a couple ways you can do it. Um, at the very highest level, what you want is you want members of your constituency that uh, are very actively promoting a project. So there's a bit of a myth here that uh, crowdfunding is a magic lamp. You know, there's obviously no such thing. So the projects right. that are very successful are the ones that have a team behind it or an actively engaged evangelist. So if you have, for instance, I'll, tell, I'll show you a project that actually uh, happened at University of California, Santa Cruz. It was the Jerry Garcia uh, Memorial Project. And what they were trying to do was um, take some of the uh, artifacts that came from his memorial ceremony when he passed away and digitize them to preserve them. Now, Normally, things like that are actually kind of difficult to raise money for. You know, it's kind of esoteric. Um, it's very hard to figure out how you package that to the base. So what they did was they created a video, and that video basically was from the uh, head archivist of the, the uh, Grateful Dead Memorial Center. And then they put that video up on certain key Facebook pages 
that were connected to that community. And all of a sudden it went viral and at one point they were getting two hits per second on their platform and they quickly raised the $10,000 goal. In fact, they had a $5,000 goal and they doubled it because they were getting such huge market traction. So the first thing to think about is who are the people who are sending your message out? Do they mm -hmm. have credibility? Do they care about the project? Um, are they willing to promote it to their initial first degree connections both in social media, email, and in the community? The second thing is to look for the relevant uh, constituents that might also benefit from it. If your cause is connected to cancer, there are multiple pages on the internet where you can post where your fundraiser is happening, both forums, Facebook, and Twitter. The second thing you can do to really help create sort of that virality effect is um, during your campaign, have a quiet phase, just like we do with everything else. So that means if you're going to do a 30-day drive, spend about eight weeks, six weeks beforehand thinking about, okay, during that drive, is there something that rises to the level of local news? Can I get the local paper, we've seen this all the time, to do a quick spot on this? Can we get the executive director of our organization to do a quick spot on the local news about you know, why this is timely or important? So you always want to time your offline activities with the uh, commencement of your project. Mm -hmm. And these are things that are so critical. So I would say get your evangelist, which again, the more the better. We find that if you can yep. get between two to five, you've got a great shot. Um, the second thing is look for certain places in the social media ecosystem that actually would love this kind of content. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cancer support groups, nature conservancy, whatever it may be that you're doing, there <laughs> are actual groups that are looking for this kind of content to champion your cause. And then finally, the offline methodologies, which are holding events or a party fundraiser, uh, throwing sort of social gatherings, or getting into a local press. Um, all of those are ways where you can start to really go beyond your typical echo chamber. And by the way, you cannot do that when you're using other things like, again, these older channels. So right. people need a way to go and land on it. They need something they can link to and something they can follow with updates. Right. Is, that, uh, just, is that good, Sarah? And I'll just yeah, jump in, Michael, because here at Arizona, we're really struggling with that as well. I think there's a misperception that you posted out on, you know, Indiegogo or Rocket Hub or whatever, and people are just going to fly by fundraise and surf fundraising. That doesn't happen very often. It's going to be a connection somehow. And so how do you get those connections out? And I think you're exactly right, Michael. So if it's a researcher doing the project, who is she, you know, who follows her on Twitter? Who reads her books? Who's come to her presentations in the past? Who's her former students? Send it to them. Ask them once they donate to send to somebody else, and that's how it happens. But there is a misperception that you just put it out there. It's not. It's not um, the field of dreams. You build it, and they will come. You you got to still let people know it's there. Um, and I think your point's a really good one, Michael. Absolutely. And we can. And you know, I, I just want to take this time that we're doing an incredibly high-level overview for everyone on this uh, presentation, but you know, there are specific strategies that we can definitely drill down in and at the end of this I'll make sure that you know you have all of our contact information if you do have specific questions around how that might work. Um, with that being said, let me go through a little bit of the basic elements of any crowdfunding project that you would want to run. The first thing is, back to that point on promotion, you need to have a way for people to actively share your content. Normally the way that we do, we use websites. Websites are more of a resource. They're kind of like, in a sense, our yellow pages. If people just happen to be dropping by our uh, particular cause, this is a place where they can get a high level overview. But they're not really a place where people can actively engage. And this is really what, uh, what you want your social mechanisms to be. So for instance, you want to make sure they can promote this in the uh, Twitter sphere. And uh, you want a built in hashtag. You know, so like for instance, this kind of technology, you can preset your hashtag so when people share it, they're on your message. Same thing with Facebook um, or direct email. The other thing is you really quickly, people, people are uh, sort of at that generation where we're in a rush. Um, there's a phrase actually that you hear being used a lot in the millennial set called grokking, G-R-O-K, and that means just quickly glancing at something and absorbing it. Um, that's exactly how they're reading all of your materials. Uh, so you want to make sure it just jumps out. Why does it matter? How will it help? 
what will it do, and what's the call to action. These are very, very high level points. You want to make sure that your technology can get that out there in a clean way and on your brand. Secondly, this is critical, updates. And this goes to that tailored stewardship. This particular uh, project was actually for um, a gentleman who was in the uh, hospital system at UCLA, and it was for concussion baseline testing for underserved uh, high school students. And this was at a time where uh, concussions were uh, top of mind because the NFL was struggling with how to, how to handle it and what rules to put into place, but nobody was thinking about the younger athletes. So this particular person uh, really made it his crusade and went out there and said, I want to help raise money to bring this awareness to the community and to help treat these students who can't afford the treatment. So what they did was they put together this nice little video. And videos, here's another quick misnomer. They're not supposed to be overly slick. This is not the video that you spend 20000 on, that's sort of your mm. video that's the face of your cause. These are supposed to be organic. You can shoot these on your iPhone. The key is just make sure that it's in a quiet room and that you turn your phone to the side because everyone hates vertical videos. Um, and then going down below, they sent updates. So as the drive was going on, they were able to send a testimonial from one of the patients and embed that video. So when donors were, after they'd given, they would get a little email that had that video that showed the impact of their gift and also help them share that with other friends. They could forward that email uh, on. These are ways that you start to stimulate interest and they don't just die on the coffee table. So these are some really cool things that you can do. As far as how you set your giving levels, obviously that's a function of what you're fundraising it, what you're fundraising for, and also your demographic. But it's that ability of showing people what it does. Fifty dollars helped bring this particular service to a student athlete. For five thousand, you could support a whole school. So that's that transparency and impact that we were talking about earlier. You want to make sure these elements are all within your campaign. So that's the first part of it. I think the second part is, what do you do in terms of how do you choose the right projects? Because many of you will find that um, within your particular uh, nonprofit, there are so many different worthy causes. Well, here's the good news. These are all finite. These are not evergreen projects, like the uh, famous drop-down menu if people want to give on your website and they have to go through like 19 clicks before they hit the uh, credit card processing page. This isn't what this is about. These are 30 or 60 day projects so that there's a sense of urgency, but more importantly, the content is refreshing. So you might run a couple of campaigns and then you go quiet for a few months, and then maybe there's some new cool causes that pop up, or maybe that's when you want to run your annual fund drive. At UCLA, when they did their initial pilot projects, they had one project that was for students that was to help them launch their companies. They had another project that was for core cancer research, and then another project that was connected to the hospital system. And they're about to roll in a whole new set of projects. So with, with you have people are saying, you know, I want my project to go up. You know, I think it should go up. I think it has a chance. There are some things that you can do to make sure that uh, they get their shot at raising the money. But more importantly, it's not a problem to have a queue. If you only want to run three at a time, that's fine, because in 60 days, you can have other projects roll on. You can have other projects roll off. So the idea here is to really allow this building in the community of this place where people can really champion your causes or what they care about. Uh, we see this, by the way, with Grateful Patient. We see this a lot um, on behalf of scholarship drives as well. So you can do this straight for annual fund projects as well. Like I said, Grateful Patient is fantastic. People can go up. They can champion what they care about. And then when they're done, that money is going into your general uh, unrestricted fund, but people are donating because of the human face that's on top of it. So that's the first thing I think that's really cool. The second thing is you want to make sure that your constituents have control. So now they can follow how their projects are doing. And I think that's so critical. You know, it's so hard right now to keep in touch with that 35 and under set, especially because they're moving for jobs. It's a very mobile generation, so you know we're constantly not getting fresh information. We don't have their updated phone numbers. They don't have their updated email. With this kind of technology, you can get all of that fresh information. They're coming to you and giving you that information as part of their gift. So this is also a great way to replenish or refresh your data for your other generalized outreach. 
And I think that's another really cool benefit to uh, moving some of your fundraising activity into the online ecosystem. So those are sort of some very high-level points. I'll pause right here, by the way, if any questions have been building up before I move into some other things. Yes, we, we do have um, a question in terms of addressing the back end of crowdfunding and, and, mm. and also um, seeing the confusion, possible confusion that might happen around what is tax deductible. Oh, well, good question. Great this question. is... Uh, my, uh, Mike, I'll let you handle it, but this is exactly what we struggled with um, because there's all the front end we talked about, you know, brand loss and, and things getting out of control. So here at my institution, what we were really worried about, because it's some of my team as well, is the back end. Because when you're working with some of these third-party vendors, what you get, um, you have to question if it's philanthropic. Um, the intention was philanthropic, the receding what do you receive them for because they take a cut from the third-party vendors what information do you get back etc so i'm gonna let michael talk a little bit about this is exactly why we went with scale funder one of the reasons and again not saying selling them there's other companies too so feel free to do the research um i encourage you all to do that but why we didn't go with a third-party vendor why we wanted our own software so mike will you just talk a little bit about the difference between a third-party vendor and having your own software, or hey, some people build it in-house, and that's okay too. We're just giving right. one example. But talk about the difference between using a third-party vendor like Indiegogo, uh, 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 Rocket Hub, and, and there's there's reasons for them, they exist, and that's good, but your own software or hiring um, a company like ScaleFunder to purchase their software. Can you talk about the back-end difference? I think it's, it's, it's pretty mega. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, so this is the hard part, which is how do you get the data in and how do you make sure that uh, the tax deductibility is accounted for? So the first part I'm going to address is tax, tax deductibility. When you go to these external sites like Kickstarter, the first thing you should know is they don't offer tax deductibility options. Now, other sites out there will, but they have to clear it through a third-party payment house. So it might be something like First Giving or they may have to, in a sense, run it through Amazon payments. So they will not use your back-end payment processor or your messaging or any of the other things you're currently using for your infrastructure. That's just point blank. They don't do it. It's not their business model. Right. Um, the second thing is the data itself. They own the data. So they may share some of it with you, but they can do whatever they want to your constituents that you drove to that site. If they want to touch them and promote other things, if they want to sell them some other product, they have the right to do that. Um, you do not control that relationship with the donor because that's their lifeblood, is that, is that data. So that's the other issue um, that you see a lot of. So when you're looking at how you would handle tax deductibility, let's say you're doing perks for a particular project. All you would have to do, for instance, in our technology, is come in and enter the fair market value. And so the fair market value, if it's just an online thank you, might be zero. But we find that the, the proper kind of strategy is as you go up the gift levels, you want to go from a virtual type of perk to an experiential perk. Because the idea here is less about giving a physical product like you see on Kickstarter and more about the experience and engagement. So for instance, we've had plenty of projects where at the higher level, people might be invited to a special access event or have coffee with the person connected to the campaign. And those are the things that are, in a sense, are the holy grail for fundraising because it's so hard to get people to directly engage with your cause. And this allows you to translate those particular givers who have the disposable income, they're sig signaling that by giving it a higher level, to come back and directly touch both your internal champion, but also potentially it gives you a chance for your major development officers uh, and major gifts to be able to have lead generation. And we mm -hmm. find that's a total game changer. To have automatic lead generation is huge, and we see this all the time with campaigns where one or two major gift prospects are surfaced during these drives, and if you structure your perks right, you can literally ferry them directly into an engagement opportunity. So, so that's how you structure it, and you would just enter in the fair market value, and that would be reflected in automated receiving. Because so that, through the, through the, 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 the third-party vendors, Michael, what – this is what we struggle with. What I would get in return is I would just get a list of names and dollar amounts, and that's it. And yeah, you might every with, once in a while get emails, but you absolutely yeah, yeah, maybe don't control emails. the data. 
And you but don't then I have to manually off. right. I have to manually enter it. The other thing that I was challenged with is they would already take a cut, so they would That's take six or seven percent. So what do I receipt them for? And am I really receiving them from a hard gift because the transaction was through a different vendor? So do I soft credit? There's a whole series of issues that we were really worried about. Whereas if we build our own or purchase software from someone like you, the back end was automatic. It was basically the same back end as making an online gift. That's right. That's right. And so that was that's the mega. That's a big difference for anyone considering. And and you just want to weigh that. Some people are okay with it. We just weren't here at at Arizona in particular. And I can tell you, by the way, you know there 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 are reasons, like you said, for all of these platforms existing. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. And sure. I think that I think that when I'm giving advice about what kinds of technology you should be pursuing, the first question I have is you know, what exactly are the goals of your organization? Mm -hmm. If you are a very, very tiny nonprofit and you're looking to do one thing, you know, once a year and, you know, your goals are very tiny, there's not a lot of brand awareness, there's not much, uh, you know, uh, uh, budgetary give in anything that you're doing, okay, maybe do a one-off on an external platform. Realize that that's going to be sort of, it has its ups and its downs. You might get some money in the door, but at the same time you're going to get some brand dilution and you won't control the data. But if you're a nonprofit that, um, you know, is above a certain level, and that level is not that high. I mean, as soon as you start trying to play in the level where you might be running some multiple campaigns a year, or you've got a pretty decent email list and base, and you've got some really cool causes or, or promotions that you want to put into the community, you have to start thinking about you know, how you commingle your brand with other brands. And it's right. exactly what you think about in anything else you do. So that's the other point. These are really engagement tools. Not only are you raising money, but you're getting thousands of potential views and you're getting new users on your platform. So these are really cool ways to develop new communication channels as well. I mean, those updates that you can provide six months a year later, you control that. So you can actually have the ability to continue the conversation well after the campaign is over, and that's exactly what donors want. So the, these are the things where it's as much about communication and engagement, which is obviously what the tip of the spear is for any kind of fundraising, as right. it is to get money into the door. You bet. That's one of the goals of, of annual um, giving as well. Question, yeah. I, I do, uh, do uh, kind of along the line of the, the, smaller, the smaller shops, but how many staff do you have keeping all the online stories, campaigns, et cetera, up to date and refreshed. We're, we are a smaller shop and only have a part-time person doing our web stuff. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll speak from here, and I've, I've been talking to some other organizations because it sounds like I'm huge here at University of Arizona. Frankly, we're not, believe it or not, um, when it comes to staff. We're going to add this on to someone's current responsibility, so I'm not going to have someone dedicated to this fully. Part of the reason is, is one, it's going to begin to supplement some other things that we do. So we might reduce some other initiatives and add this in. What it also um, really does is the writing, the videos, um, the communications, all that is owned by the project manager, and that's the difference. So someone internally isn't going to write, I'm not going to have a fundraiser write the solicitation and make the video and all that. That's the project manager. That's the person whose cause it is. So they do. 90% of the work, I look at it just to make sure that it isn't a train wreck <laughs> and provide the software to get it up and running. Um, and in fact, what we're going to do here, and, and other people might look at this, we're going to have a, an agreement that if your project goes up, here's the things you agree to do and that you own those things and that this, by putting your project up, this is what you agree to do on your end. So it actually puts some of the ownership back into the lap of your researchers, your your actual program coordinators, the people out in the field. So it doesn't have to be a lot more work. The other thing too is you don't have to put up a zillion projects at a time. Put a couple up at a time. Michael, anything to jump in there on that? Because that's a that's a good question. No, I mean I think you nailed it right at the end as well. You know, you start you start off slowly. We see this with all uh, all of our clients in particular, where you know year one is where you're building your sea legs. You know, you're you're putting out projects, you're figuring out some things that work for you, um, and it's really more about, like you said, managing uh, those people that are championing those projects. And we find that a, you, know, you can just take a current FTE uh, and then have them allocate part of their responsibilities on building this out. 
as it becomes over the coming years a more pronounced part yeah. of your strategy, yeah. you can just you know expand the uh, expand the needs accordingly. Right, and I think that's what we're going to do. I, I don't want to um, cut off any more that you have to share, Michael, but we're starting to hit that near hour mark, and we'll sure. still take questions, but before yeah, we, we – I, I thought we could sorry. at least show contact information. Sure, yeah, yep. absolutely. We, do you want me to keep going with questions, guys? I think we could take yes, another please. one or two, and, Michael, if you want to put our, our contact information, because, Michael, um, as he indicated – um, we are just giving you just uh, a touch of what this field is, and some of it obviously is still being um, discovered as well. So you see Michael's there. I'll give you mine as well. Um, it's, uh, I'll give you my personal. Please use responsibly. Um, it's Brian, B-R-I-A-N underscore Kish at yahoo.com, or you'll also find me at annualgiving at campbellandcompany.com. Um, and, it, and for anyone, uh, oh, sorry about that, Brian. I was just going to say, for anyone who's looking, uh, please contact me. Be more than happy to just, if you even want to discuss strategy as you're thinking about what you're trying to do. Um, you know, I'm just really passionate about what this can do for a lot of causes uh, out there in the world. And frankly, like I said, there are many options for you. So, you know, this is this has just been a wonderful opportunity. I wanted to thank everyone for. I know how busy everyone is. Thank you for uh, for your time out there. That. But we'll we'll take one one or two more questions. How about that? Okay. All right. Uh, is there research that addresses how many donors acquired by crowdsourcing campaigns convert with a second gift to the organization beyond the Ooh. initial campaign? I like that's that question. A, that's an yeah. awesome question. So crowdfunding in terms of the nonprofit world is only about two to three years old. And it started off with individuals fundraising for their specific causes. So we're just now getting that data. Um, I would say that you'll probably have that question fully answered this year in terms of your first batch of data because the first generation of projects have really all gone up this past year. And now people are starting to take some of the, um, some of the people within those and starting the secondary ask. So yeah. I, don't want, I don't think there's a firm answer to that. No. You're going to see that resolve itself over the coming uh, months and probably next year. I agree. And then I had another question. What are the methodologies for using crowdfunding sites with an older constituent base? Is this a successful strategy for a 55-plus constituent? Yes, yes, and yes. So actually, this is kind of interesting. Facebook, the fastest growing different demographic is actually that constituency you just referenced. So they're actually uh, really responding well to crowdfunding projects that are also promoted through those, that particular channel. Um, and what's also great about that is they use crowdfunding not as an entry level gift, but they're using it more as a higher level gift because, and I'll give you some examples. We've had projects where people will give between one and $10,000 directly through the project, and they all come from that particular demographic. Uh, every once in a while, it will go into the 40s. Um, and what's great about that is they're all major gift prospects once they start giving at that level, but they're telling us directly what they care about. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's huge. So we had a project right here. I'll show you this one. This is a really neat one. So at UCLA, when they ran these three in concert, um, this project over here, the Brainsport Project, sent out an email blast uh, to just the people that they knew were on their particular mailing list. You know, the faculty lead and a couple others had a mailing list. And someone came in and gave $500 and then actually shared that project uh, with her father. The father then came to the site, saw the project, but then all of a sudden saw this project, project over here about the entrepreneurial students and ended up giving a sizable gift through it. And this person we found out gave that gift through their iPhone and was 70 years old and was a billionaire. Now, yeah. all of that was huge because, A, the institution thought that that particular person cared only about medical projects, and, two, because they were 70, they never thought to solicit that person electronically. Mm -hmm. They were spending expensive and large amounts of money on print collateral when this gentleman was using uh, an iPhone. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot that you see in that generation where smartphone penetration rates are going through the roof, as well as Facebook adoption. Maybe we'll take one more and then we'll probably close yeah. out. 
Perfect. Uh, and this is to you, Brian. Would you be willing to share the written agreement of expectations made with the project manager? I will. I don't have it yet because we haven't launched ours. We're launching in the next couple weeks. So literally, uh, I have my to-do list in front of me. It's on my to-do list. I'm on a long flight here in the next uh, two days. I'm, I'm flying, and uh, that's my main project. So um, if that particular person wanted to reach out to me once I have it, absolutely. Um, and uh, would be would be happy to do that. And again, even if you're wanting to think about it before then, you know, talk to Michael as well about what he's seeing with some of the other clients. But again, it's you know you're gonna put up a video, you're going to follow up with um, you know an update by this date. You're gonna agree to do the follow-up to any of the stewardship or perks. Um, you know, those are the things that we're gonna put on there. We're also gonna put out guidelines. You know, looking at Michael, would you would you say Good projects are amounts are typically between five and thirty. Is is that right, or or is yeah, that absolutely too small? I, I mean, no, no, no. That, yeah, that that that's pretty. That's a pretty good range we're seeing. And then the only time you see it go above that is really when there's a celebrity component or an annual yeah. fund component where there's sort of an all hands on deck drive by an institution. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So you know, and those are the expectations that we're going to set. So for anyone that's out there looking at these things. Before you really go too deep, one of the things I'd really recommend, we've had to struggle here and with some of my clients I work with, is setting expectations. Again, just like people thought with texting and everything else, everyone thinks it's an answer or they hear it and think it's cool, you know, and this is the way you do it. I think this one's different. And matter of fact, I know it's different because the results already show that it's different. But um, set expectations appropriately. Just because you got a cool project that you think everyone's going to love, just because you put it out there, doesn't mean that's the end of the deal. There's a lot more work still to be done. So, um, you know, I'd recommend you, you set expectations appropriately. But uh, with, with that, I'm going to send my thanks, um, let Michael yeah. do his thanks, and then let Sarah finish. So, again, um, I know I saw some of the login, some people I know. So so good to see you all uh, involved, happy to discuss further. And most importantly, you know, um, good luck with all your fundraising. And I think. Uh, this is a great tool that's not only good for your organizations, but I think ultimately good for your donors. And I think this was about. So, Michael, any final comments? Uh, you know, I'll just just piggybacking on that. I want to thank everyone, and you know, if you have questions, uh, you know, please please reach out to uh, either Brian or I. And also, you know, realize that when you're thinking about how to approach this, um, you you definitely want to partner up with groups that aren't just giving you technology but also giving you training and best practices because as Brian mentioned you know the the, the technology is only part of it it's also what you're doing and, and how you launch it so you know you really looking forward to hearing from uh, those of you that are interested and, and thank you so much for your time yeah thanks guys and, and Michael if you will just go to the last slide um, sure. and just a reminder um, for so first off thanks to everybody who joined us today and Special thanks to Michael and Brian. It was very interesting. Our next webinar is set for actually next week, um, January 22nd. We're going to be looking at scorecards for your organization. We'll have Carrie Dahlquist, who is our Director of Strategic Information Services, He's present good. that. Um, yeah, uh, so please feel free to register online at our website. There's a lot of good information in store for that one. So again, thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thanks so much. Absolutely. That's what you Bye-bye.